দুই আয়াত নম্বর দুইশো যারা আল্লাহর রাস্তায় সম্পদ ব্যয় করে তাদের উদাহরণটা হচ্ছে শস্যদানার ন্যায় যেটি বৃদ্ধি পায় সাত শিশে এবং প্রত্যেক শিশে আছে একশোটি দানা এবং আল্লাহ সালা যাকে ইচ্ছা বৃদ্ধি করে দেন যদি আপনি আল্লাহর রাস্তায় ব্যয় করেন আপনি রিটার্ন পাবেন সাতশো গুণ বেশি ব্যবসায়িক ভাষায় আপনি তাহলে সেখানে পাবেন সত্তর হাজার পার্সেন্ট আর কোন ব্যবসা আপনাকে এর চেয়ে বেশি মুনাফা দিতে পারবে আজই বিনিয়োগ করুন আল্লাহ তালার রাস্তায় This week we have a very special guest, one of the great orators of Dawah in the English language. We'd like to welcome Dr. Zakir Naik. Welcome, brother. Thank you very much. Now, we'd like to know just a little of your background. You have the title doctor, so presumably you were a medical man. What changed you from the path of medicine to the path of Dawah? Alhamdulillah. Wassalatu wassalamu rasulillah wa ala ahli wa sahibi ajma'in. By qualification, I'm a medical doctor. I passed my MBBS from Bombay, Nair Hospital. It was in the year 1987 when Sheikh Didat, when he visited Bombay, my father was the host. And he is the person who is instrumental in changing my career from being a full-time medical doctor to a full-time guy. He is the one who inspired me into the field of Dawah. So while I was in the medical college in the second year, I got involved in the field of Dawa. And after I finished my MBBS, I used to practice both half-time my medicine, half-time Dawa. And then I got involved more into the Dawa field. And then it was two hours medical practice, remaining Dawa. Since the past about six years, I'm a full-time Dai, Alhamdulillah. Do you find it too difficult to be a doctor and a Dahi? There's uh, too much uh, energy spread too thinly. Yes, I agree that if I want to be an expert in both the fields, being full-time expert Dai and a full-time medical doctor is difficult. You can't be master of all. So that is the reason I prefer choosing being a full-time Dai than being a full-time doctor. Because in the world we have thousands of doctors, alhamdulillah. We have very few full-time Dais and we require people who are intellectuals to present Islam. That is the reason I chose to be a full-time Dai and I gave up my profession completely. Now, the city where you live, Mumbai as it's called now, it's a very special place, isn't it? And you started your Islamic center with what aim in mind? I mean, what was your target audience? Initially, when I started the center, our main objective of the Islamic Research Foundation was to concentrate on the Muslim educated youth those who go to medical colleges, engineering colleges, and those who have an inferior complex. And they feel that Islam is an outdated religion. The Quran was revealed 1400 years ago, and the teaching of Islam not to have alcohol, not to have pork, man is allowed to have more than one wife. All these teachings they feel are outdated. So to prove to them that, alhamdulillah, Islam is far more advanced even than modern science. Our main aim was to concentrate on the inferior complex, the young Muslims who have this complex, and secondly, to concentrate on the educated non-Muslims. The educated non-Muslims. Non and to remove the misconceptions what they have about Islam. Because the majority of these non-Muslims, they acquire the knowledge from the media, from the books written by the Westerners, and they have distorted the picture of Islam. So to remove the misconceptions from the minds of non-Muslims, besides speaking about the Quran, the Sahih Hadith, we also prove their Islamic points by reason, logic, and science. Now has Allah blessed you with success in this field? I mean, uh, you feel that uh, the educated Muslim youth are 
made more aware of their deen by your efforts? As the glorious Quran says in Surah Aisha, chapter 88, verse 21, Fazakrina manta muzakri. I had obviously delivered the message, the rest giving hidayah in the hands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But alhamdulillah, with Allah's grace, we have had a tremendous success. We have been able to show in the Bombay city, which is the only non-Muslim city in the world, we show our programs on the cable TV network for about two to three hours to more than a million homes. It's every day? Every day for two to three hours. And it is hardcore dawa. I'm not talking only about salah or qirat, which is good. Hardcore dawa means talking to the Christians, to the Hindus, to the Sikhs, to the Parsis, because India is the country where I've got a variety of religions. And speaking to them with hikmah, with wisdom, with reason, logic, and science. And alhamdulillah, we get a tremendous response doctors, lawyers, scientists, engineers, they call us up and they're impressed with the programs and they come to our functions at the center where we have, alhamdulillah, every week, four times, lectures, programs, which is always followed by question and answer session with the non-Muslims, the reactive part. What is your plan for the future with your organization? You want to get more into media? You're establishing yourselves with a TV program. Do you plan to expand this? Yeah, that's right. I believe that at present, the international media is not in the hands of the Muslims. The major drawback is that the media is not in the hands of the Muslims. The international newspapers, the television channels, the satellite channels, not a single full-time Dawa TV channel do we have. Yes, we have Muslim governments who have the channels which have other programs, but not a single full-time Islamic channel presenting the correct picture of Islam full-time. Since we aren't that big. What we said, what I have always a philosophy. If you have a name, whatever limited resources we have, we start with that. So Alhamdulillah, we have been successful. We have our own studio. We have our own broadcast studio where we have cameras and editing system and the equipment. We shoot the programs of various scholars that we call from abroad. Alhamdulillah, there are talks which I give. And we have been successful in showing our programs to more than 125 countries thrice a week, Alhamdulillah. On various channels like, yes, like ATN, NEPC, and we have got software for several hundred hours. The other thing I wanted to ask you was the, um, the growth of uh, Muslim schools in India. Do you see a chance, for example, English medium schools that give a good secular education with Islamic education? Do, do you see anything of that happening? This is a major drawback throughout the world, especially in India, that we don't have Muslim schools with give secular education if you want to use that word, along with the Islamic ethics. Yes, there are several schools in India which have the secular education and they have one class only in a week or maximum two classes which teach the dinyat, you know, Islamic mm -hmm. teaching. But what I feel that only having one class of half an hour, 45 minutes or two classes of 45 minutes is not sufficient. It's not sufficient. We have in a project in the near future of having an Islamic school which has a striking balance between the Darul Ulum that we have, which teaches only Quran, Sharia, yes, yes. Hadith, which is important. Yes. And here we have several Muslim schools which teach only secular education. Our new project that we have is having an Islamic school of international standard, of very high grade, having both teaching Quran, Hadith, Sharia of equal time. If we don't get the recognition what we believe that in the initial stages, we'll only teach on the Islamic concept. And when we teach the other secular education, what we believe we should link that education with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, with the Quranic teaching, otherwise it is useless. For example, if you have to teach about the Big Bang in science, we have to link that, you know, the Quran says in Surah Ambiya, chapter 21, verse 30, that do not the unbelievers see the heavens and the earth were joined together and we clove them asunder. So we have our new project to have an Islamic school which has a striking balance, both, so that if a person passes, he's even well aware of the world today. And after he passes from the school, he can become a doctor, he can become an engineer, as well as the grounding of the Islamic Sharia, the Quran, the Sahih Hadith. You've been to the States, haven't you? You've been yeah, to, yeah. Do you see a growing number of, say, like the white Americans, European Americans coming to Islam now? What have you seen? Alhamdulillah, today, the fastest growing religion in America, in USA, is our religion, Islam, alhamdulillah. And when I keep on traveling, I find, besides the blacks, alhamdulillah, there are several blacks accepting Islam, even the whites, alhamdulillah. I've been to several cities, Chicago, LA, New York, Houston, Atlanta, several places, alhamdulillah. They're accepting, and the main reason is because if you compare 
with logic. Any religion in the world. Number one comes Islam. Islam is the most logical religion. It is the most scientific religion. It has the solutions to the problems of the humankind. So that's what I feel. It attracts them towards Islam. जीवन पुरो बदले जाए सबकिस्लामित पद्धत प्रचार सकाल छंगल बंधु जान कबीरा गुना बेचे थकते चान कबीरा गुना जुग दिन देख बड़ गुना कल सन्दा साढ़े पांच टाय पुनः सम्प्रचार सकाल छंगलेशी बांगल मन धोना चोख जबान करते छोट बड़ अनेक भूल शरियत बिरोधी बहु क्ज There's a large Indian Muslim population in America and Canada and so forth. Do you see them having problems with their children? I mean, their children are going to school with these American boys and girls who are dating and drinking and all that. Do you see a clash of generations there? Yes, compared to the Muslims who are not originally American, who are settled in America, what I feel that this polarization. There are some Muslims who feel that because of society, our children may go to one extreme and may get influenced by the American society. They have built, alhamdulillah, several organizations, several centers where they teach them about Quran, Hadith, etc. So what we have now, I believe, this polarization. Some people, alhamdulillah, are on the deen, and they've seen to it that their children go to the centers. On the other hand, some people have gone to the other extreme. So you have polarization, very few people in the middle. Either they have become completely westernized, going far away from Islam, or alhamdulillah, they're on the true track. There is a movement, alhamdulillah, trying to get those Muslims who have gone away from Islam to get them back to the fold of Islam, mainly with giving talks, proving that Islam is the most logical religion. And the reason I feel, even in India or any part of the world, when an educated man goes away from Islam, because he's influenced by science and the modern world and the advances, because when he goes and asks a question to a Muslim, that why not to have Pope? So he will tell you, Allah says that, finish, that's final. Why not to have alcohol? Allah says that, it's finished. Yes, we agree. We have Iman, Allah says we have to obey. I agree with them totally. But a person who doesn't have Iman, who doesn't have Taqwa, whose Iman is very low, whose Taqwa is low, we have to rule with Hikmah. We have to prove to them scientifically what are the defects in having Pope, why a person should not have alcohol, why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has allowed some men to have more than one wife. So if you speak to them logically, believe me, alhamdulillah, they're so convinced that they're proud to call themselves Muslims. They don't feel shy to have beard, they don't mind covering their head, they don't mind saying in public that we are Muslims. Otherwise, they have an inferiority complex. This inferiority complex is still there, even though the British have gone a long time. I mean, 
it's the pressure from the West That's right. through technology or yes mainly because uh, they feel that see now the country which is advancing the most is America is Europe they're on top of the world the Muslims are downtrodden and the reason is that the Muslims I feel have gone away from the Quran and the Sunnah the Europeans called the 8th to the 11th or 12th century the dark ages it wasn't dark it was dark for the Europeans yeah. not for the world That's right. The Arabs were very much advanced. Mm -hmm. And in my talk, Alhamdulillah, I give references of several Muslim scientists, doctors, because they were close to the Quran and Sunnah. Now, the Muslims are going away from the Quran and Sunnah. That is the reason we are becoming backward. On the other hand, the Westerners, they are going away from their religion, therefore they are getting advanced. But they are getting something, but at the same time, of course, you know, their social order is becoming corrupt. And especially drugs and you know illicit sex. That's right. Drugs on the increase, rape is on the increase. According to 1996 statistics of the National Crime Bureau of USA, every day 2,713 cases of rape. Every 32 second one rape is taking place. So it is advancing in science and technology, but in moral values, crime is on the increase, rape is on the increase, molestation on the increase, homosexuality is on the increase then drug addiction on the increase. And this is not just in the so-called lower classes, but it goes through the whole strata, doesn't it? It's, it's a very sad thing. And of course, many of us Europeans who became Muslims, we started thinking uh, from that angle of vision, that yes, okay, we got some clever technology and uh, smart bombs and things like this. But uh, generally people are not happy and that their uh, social habits are getting worse. We had an American psychiatrist on the program uh, last year sometime. He was saying that even amongst the educated Americans, people have lost all their good qualities. They don't have any love for anyone. They're only thinking of themselves. They don't have any patience. They don't have any loyalty to anything. It's all self-centered, you know. And because of that, they eventually have to receive psychiatric treatment. That's right. The profession which is maximum flourishing is psychiatrist and second is a lawyer, the advocate. Lawyers, <laughs> yeah, for the divorces. And I do agree with you that on the face of it, it may seem that they are very happy because they lead a luxurious life, they have the equipment, they have the gadgets. But deep within the heart, believe me, I doubt whether most of them are happy. A few of them, of course, they taste some happiness occasionally, but by and large, it's not happening. What's your methodology for dealing with non-Muslims? How do you approach the dawah to them? There are various ways and techniques and methodologies of doing da'wah to the non-Muslims. Some are less effective, some are more effective. What we feel, that even if we speak a thousand good points about Islam to a non-Muslim, yet he'll have a few questions in his mind. You know, you say, yes, I agree with this thousand points you're speaking about, but oh, you're the same man who marries more than one woman. Ah, you're the people who keep the women in the veil. Your religion was spread by the sword. Oh, you are the people who don't have alcohol. So these questions will prick in his mind and will prevent him from accepting the beauty of Islam. So what we do whenever we meet a non-Muslim or a non-Muslim comes to us, we ask him that what do you feel is wrong with Islam? And we make him comfortable. You can criticize Islam. You can speak against Islam. No problem. We can take it. What do you feel is wrong with Islam with your limited knowledge from whatever knowledge you have, whether right or wrong? What do you feel is wrong? And what we have realized, that there are hardly about 20 most common questions which the non-Muslims have against Islam. 20? 20. 20 most common. Which other spoke about why is a man allowed to have more than one wife? Why aren't women allowed to have more than one husband? Why are some people with the sword? Why do you have non veg Why don't you have pork? Why don't you have alcohol? Why the women inherit half the share of the man? Why are two women witness equal to one witness of man? And all these questions they have. So when we ask the question, what do you feel is wrong with Islam? They pose four or five questions, which invariably fall among these 20 questions. The moment we clarify the misconception in their mind, now their mind is blank. If they have these queries and we talk about Islam, everything overflows. If the cup is full, it will overflow. So first we empty the cup. The moment you remove the misconception, even if you speak 50 good points about Islam, they accept it. So this is our strategy, Alhamdulillah, which has been very successful. And we follow the guidelines of the glorious Quran from Surah Al-Imran, chapter 3, verse 64, which says, Ta'ala ila qalmitin, sawa'im bayna Come to common terms as print us and you. 
So first we talk about the commonality. The difference is, will come later on. So we speak about the commonality between Islam and Hinduism, Islam and Christianity, Islam and Buddhism, Islam and Sikhism. And Alhamdulillah, we quote their scriptures whenever we give references. So that has an impact. These two strategies are the common points and first removing the misconceptions. This Alhamdulillah, we feel we have been very successful. And these common questions are the same. Even in Bombay, even in America, even in Europe, it's the same. There may be additional questions depending upon the locality. For example, when I go to states, there is an additional question, why don't you all take riba? Why don't you take interest? Which is even then India, but less as compared to the Western world. So, Alhamdulillah, we train our dais first to master the answers to these 20 common questions. In the, in the West, there's a lot of skepticism about the media, especially in America. Media hype, they call it. They, they know that the media tells lies on a regular basis. Is that the same in India, or do they have a healthy respect for the gentlemen of the press? Or? No, it's the same. It's the same. The media, I feel, in most part of the world, it's the same. I mean, it's difficult if the media wants to show a person to be honest and good, etc., they can do it. And that is the reason that we have our programs and we remove the misconceptions which is normally there in the media. For example, regularly the media says that the women are degraded in Islam. So we have a talk, women rights in Islam. Now the media is always talking about, for example, there are certain people in the press who keep on writing, Quran is not the word of God. So we have a talk, is the Quran God's word? And when we have such talk in public, alhamdulillah, there is a great section of non-Muslims coming. We give more time for question and succession than the talk. The talk may be for one hour, question and succession for two hours. And, Time, alhamdulillah, and what we feel that dialogue is better than a monologue. And here the non-Muslims, we make them comfortable, they can ask any questions. And these questions which they get from the media, they ask that, isn't it so that Quran has a contradiction which I heard Yes, sir. in the television, and then you give the answer, alhamdulillah. It's a good uh, technique. Alhamdulillah. Now your father's a psychiatrist, isn't he? Yeah. Yeah. So you try to remove the mental blocks from the patient, I mean, the, the non-Muslim. Yeah, it's good. Do you write books also? Have you got? Yes, there are about six books under print. Of your own? Uh, inshallah, it will be released next month. The topic of the first book is Misconception about Islam. We're replying the answers to the most common questions asked by non-Muslims, the 20 most common questions. And the other one which will be printed next month is Quran and Modern Science, Compatible or Incompatible. These two are going to be released immediately. And after that, the other books are Women Rights in Islam, Is the Quran God's Word. Although India is the land of 200 languages or more, you concentrate in English. That's right. What we feel that there are various organizations working in different languages. At present in India, there's a lacuna that there are hardly any organization or very few working amongst the English-speaking audience. So we have specialized mainly in the English-speaking and we distribute literature free in English, the Quranic translation in English, lectures in English and simultaneously we are in little activities in Urdu and Hindi but not to as large a scale as the English language. English is still a vibrant growing language in India, huh? Yes, because amongst the educated class, if you have to become an engineer or a doctor, you have to know English. So Alhamdulillah, we try and convince the intellectual class. Because once the intellectual class is convinced, the leader is convinced, after him there are many people to follow. Of course, the, um, the rural India is an enormous population, isn't it? Are there Muslim organizations working with these people? Yes, there are many Muslim organizations going to the rural areas. But the strategy of working amongst the rural people in the villages is a bit slightly different. We can't speak about science and technology, etc. Yes, logic is there a little bit. We have our people also going, alhamdulillah. Mm. Yes. Your organization? What, yes, alhamdulillah. Mm. alhamdulillah. What we believe when we go to these areas like Gujarat, etc., when we speak to them, we have to speak more about brotherhood. Because more than 300 million Indians, they are Dalits, known as untouchables, the Shudras. And amongst the Hindu religion, we have the caste system, you know. Are they actually Hindus at all, I wonder? Because I know when I was in India, these Dalits told me they're not allowed in the temple. Is that correct? Yeah, that's right. So how can they be? <laughs> that's mean? right. So the, yeah, the Hindu, when the government has to lay percentage, how many Hindus are there, then they include them to show the figure more than 80%. You understand? So these people, when we speak to them, we have to speak about the brother in Islam. And the Quran says in Surah Hujurat, 
chapter 14 verse number 13 ya ayyuhan nasu inna khalaqnakum min zakin wa unsa wa jalnakum shawban wa qaba'ila li ta'rafu inna kramukum inda allah yatqakum inna allah alimun khabir that all human kind we have created you from a single pair of male and female and have been divided into nations and tribes so that you shall be recognized not that you shall be uh, despised and the most honorable in the sight of allah is the one who has taqwa so in islam if a person receives any reward from allah subhanahu wa ta'ala it's not based on wealth caste color sex it's based on taqwa on god consciousness piety righteousness so these teachings alhamdulillah influence them and one thing common that when we work amongst the villages the rural area there their parents like the western culture like the western society they do not object to that great a level as compared to the cities if a son or a daughter from a dalit family in the rural area if they accept islam they don't mind so much because they know that you know here they talk about brotherhood they talk about equality which is not the case in the cities in the cities we have a retaliation from the family members in the villages the retaliation is less sometimes and they don't mind at all like in the western world a son if he accepts islam there will be little bit retaliation but not to that great extent they don't mind you know yes. that they're open and they're broad minded so that is there alhamdulillah in the rural areas that's a great advantage when i was in dublin you know because i came a muslim in, in ireland uh, we had um, a brother from hong kong you know he converted from their kind of buddhism to islam so when he told his mother on the telephone her first question was will it affect your studies when he said no then she's not worried at all well we'd like to thank you for coming on the program and explaining about your uh, dawa work in india it's been very interesting so we thank you and uh, we hope to see you again in the emirates assalamu alaikum from dr zakanayak and myself assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh justice can we spare a little peace the children of all people of the world can we spare a little love can we spare a little prayer for the children of the world সম্পদকে সুরক্ষিত না রাখতে পারে বিনিয়োগ আপনার সম্পদকে না বৃদ্ধি করতে পারে কিন্তু জাকাত দিলে নিশ্চয়ই আপনার সম্পদ বাড়বে থাকবে সুরক্ষিত এবং পবিত্র পিস টিভির সাথে থাকুন আপনার জাকাত দানের অর্থ পাঠাতে পারেন আইআরএফআই আলট্রায়ান ব্যাংক কোয়াড্রান কোড 48 ক্যালথর্প রোড বার্মিংহাম ইউকে পাউন্ড অ্যাকাউন্ট নাম্বার 01132301 iban gb bando loyd 30963340102492 short code 300083 swift bic code ibo bzb22 taka pathi amader email korun admin at the rate pstv.tv pstv manobotar samadhan আসসালামু আলাইকুম ওয়া রাহমাতুল্লাহ আমি মোহাম্মদ হাশিম মাদানি আর আপনারা দেখছেন পিস টিভি বাংলা পরিচর্যা ছাড়া কোন জিনিসই তার সৌন্দর্যতা টিকা রাখতে পারে না ঠিক তেমনই ঈমান ও আমলের পরিচর্যা ছাড়া একজন মুমিনও তার লক্ষ্য উদ্দেশ্যে বুঝতে পারে না আসুন রসুল সাল্লাহ আলিসাল্লামের রেখে যাওয়া বাণী শ্রবণের মাধ্যমে নিজের ইমান তাজা করুন এবং রেয়াদুস সালাহিনের দর্শে আমার সাথে থাকুন দেখুন রিয়াজুস সালেহিন কাল সন্ধ্যা ছটায় পুনঃসম্প্রচার দুপুর বারোটায় বাংলাদেশে পিস টিভি বাংলায়